Hi, this is New York State Controller Tom DiNapoli. Thanks for joining us today as we celebrate Asian Pacific American Heritage Month, where we celebrate the vast history, culture, and accomplishments of Asian American Pacific Islanders here in New York State. Asian and Pacific Americans are an important part of our country's story, and certainly that's the case here in the Empire State. New York is home to the second largest Asian American Pacific Islander population in the country. According to the latest U.S. Census, New York City's AAPI population grew by more than 30 percent. Similar to other large Asian American hubs, there's been tremendous growth and also shifts in the range of ethnicities. The last two decades have seen a huge increase in the Himalayan population here in New York, including Tibetans. While Tibetans began to immigrate to the United States in the 1950s, large-scale immigration only started in the early 1990s. Today, New York State is home to the biggest Tibetan population in the United States. And that brings us to our guest joining me today, Pema Genkong. Pema is the Queen's Regional Director of our office's Intergovernmental and Community Affairs Division. She was born in exile to Tibetan refugees. Pema, thanks for sitting down with me for this discussion today. You have uh, an incredible background, an incredible personal story. So why don't you just start with your personal story? Uh, thank you for having me, Controller. Um, I am, as you said, the daughter of Tibetan refugees. My siblings and I were born in exile. Uh, we grew up between Nepal and India, um, where I also went to school. And after college, I took some time off, and that's uh, when I decided to do some traveling. Um, I was able to live in Thailand for a little bit, uh, do some volunteer work in Nepal, uh, work as a volunteer English teacher for newly arrived Tibetan refugees in India. Lived in Mexico City and did some other fun things. Um, and eventually I ended up in the United States on a trip um, and I qualified for a work permit, and here I am today, over eight years later. When you came to the U.S., did you know you wanted to be here in New York, or did you explore other options in the U.S.? No, uh, New York was the first, I mean, uh, I, JFK was my port of entry, mm. and I didn't really, I actually wasn't sure if I wanted to live in the U.S. when I, I thought I was just going to be here for a little while for a visit. Um, and then I qualified for the work permit, as I said, and then um, decided to stay on and see, you know, what the city was about. So you, you've done many interesting things and a yes. lot of work with communities and people. What drew you to public service and to serving in a government position? So when I first came to the U.S., I didn't really have a professional network, as you can imagine, which is also the case with many other immigrants. Um, after turning down several jobs where I didn't feel like I would be presented with the level of challenge and growth that I was looking for, I heard about the position in Senator Jessica Ramos's office. Um, and in that position, I thought, well, I recognized a I recognized an opportunity to merge my passion for public service with uh, an opportunity to learn about the intricacies of local government. I knew nothing about uh, the New York City and state systems at that point. Um, and then if we go back to answering this question from another angle, so according to the United Nations, uh, Tibetans are the most successful refugee group in the world. Uh, but regardless of how comfortable your life may be, um, the life of a refugee, an alien, or someone who's stateless is just uh, filled with complications. Um, and it's inevitable that you experience some level of legal marginalization. Mm. Um, and it is living on the fringes of society um, that really made me understand the value of being heard and being seen um, and being included. And it, it must have given you a, uh, an awesome sense of 
responsibility, opportunity to be the first Tibetan to be employed in the state Senate. You mentioned Senator Ramos, you know, who's a, a very active member of the legislature. Yes. I'm sure a lot of great work came through her office. And of course, we were very fortunate when we had an opportunity and you came to work for the state controller's <laughs> office. And you are a, 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 just a very constant presence in Queens. And as we all know, Queens is really the international borough, right? There, there are every language that's represented in the United States is represented in, in Queens County. That's right. Um, and I think you touched on it, but maybe you could expand a little more on your view being um, Tibetan and, and knowing firsthand the challenges of the Tibetan refugee community here in New York, um, where we are right now in 2024, how do you see the community being able to access services and uh, really to survive and thrive in New York City? And what role do you see for government to, to be supportive in that regard? For the most part, Tibetans are, you know, we are a resilient uh, group of people. Most of us have experienced dis multiple rounds of displacement. So we've really learned to be self-reliant and self-sufficient for the most part. Um, and you know that's that goes the that's the same for Tibetans in New York State as well. Uh, most have managed to build, you know, a decent life for themselves. Uh, but Which is why you said earlier the UN recognized the community as one of the more successful yes, refugee communities. Yes. Yeah. Uh, but still, you know, the fact that we are uh, a minority within minorities still remains. Mm. Uh, so we're definitely a smaller minority. So um, when it comes to representation in many different areas of life, including government, uh, I do feel like they, there is a lot more that could be done. Um, this is the story of many different immigrant communities, as you know. You know, the first generation is just kind of happy to be in the country and grateful and really trying to feed their families and build a life for the kids and send them to school. And then it's only with the second generation and the ones after that, you know, you really start demanding like a place at the table. Mm -hmm. um, but in that sense, it gives me a sense, it gives me, it makes me proud to be able to say that many of us, many Tibetans like myself who are uh, new, who are first generation immigrants um, in the United States, uh, you know, are not satisfied just to um, have all of these different opportunities at hand. Uh, we're also trying to kind of uh, get a seat at the table. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, no, I, I, I think you touched on exactly the points I wanted to bring out. And I think, you know, from my experience, you've brought me to Tibetan community events yes. in Queens. And I've always been very impressed at the mutual support that's there in the network of the community. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's always important to have community members look out for each other first and foremost, right. and then to have some sense of unity in trying to get government to provide mm -hmm. more services. Is that a challenge though, given the history of, of being refugees and, and the issue of what happened to Tibet, you know, back right. in the, uh, I guess in the 50s when right. you know, the Dalai Lama went into exile. Is there a, is there a built-in distrust of government? Is that is that an, an issue as far as accessing the services that government here in this country provides? I don't know if I would use the word distrust or, you know, maybe that's too strong, but there definitely is a slight hesitation. And that hesitation could have come from, uh, you know, our story of occupation, uh, but it could also be because, um, some of the host countries that many of the Tibetans in exile have lived in, um, while we're very, very grateful to them for taking us in at a time of need, um, you know, the government, the governments weren't structured with Tibetans in mind. I mean, the, the governments weren't, uh, the system wasn't designed for Tibetans. Um, so we are, I think for the most part, really, kind of um, content with doing, working hard, doing our best and making things happen for ourselves without really thinking about how to 
get a lot of support from government, mm. uh, which I think um, at this point is changing and definitely needs to change because uh, working with government is not just about receiving services, it's about much more. Mm. Your family's had uh, a close association with His Holiness the Dalai Lama. And I had the privilege of meeting your uncle, yes. uh, who has played a very important role over the years. Just share with us a little bit about your family's connection, your uncle's role, because I think it's very special. I don't know if uh, association with the Dalai Lama would be uh, you know, an accurate re representation, but uh, my uncle did serve for uh, his own as the Dalai Lama for, uh, as his private secretary for over 40 years. Um, and I, I could go on all day about him. I could talk about him all day, as, you're, as you know. Um, your uncle. Yes. As well as the Dalai Lama, but your uncle is who we're talking about. Both of them. Because <laughs> when I met him, he, was, he, he couldn't have been uh, more of a gentleman. Yes, and he, he gave me the book, you know, about his experience, which was wonderful. He really is wonderful. He's a very, very special person to me, as you know. I, he's definitely one of the best human beings I know in life. Um, and strangely enough, and I've said this to you before, I don't know if you remember, uh, when I first started working for you, I saw similarities. I, you reminded me of my uncle. Well, I'm very humbled to honor to hear that. Thank you. <laughs> um, I think I should also mention here that my sister uh, is also, uh, she works for the Tibetan government in exile. She is, uh, she serves as the representative of Sonus the Dalai Lama to the European Union. Oh. Ah. As, I, as you know, I shared with you the picture of yes. me and the Dalai Lama when he was honored by Hofstra University, mm -hmm. my alma mater. And I remember your reaction because uh, you thought I was making it up that I yes. met the Dalai Lama. <laughs> but that was a, a wonderful experience. And obviously many people in New York have had the opportunity to meet him and learn from him and experience his, uh, his way, which is beautiful and spiritual but also his great sense of humor. Mm -hmm. He's a very down-to-earth religious leader, isn't he? He really is. Yeah. His illness, so uh, we're, Tibetans are lucky to have him. Yeah, important symbol for the community. Mm -hmm. Pema, I really appreciate you sharing your, your thoughts and your insights. And certainly, we're so proud to have you as part of the Office of State Controller team. I really appreciate the work you do with intergovernmental uh, relations and community affairs. But in terms of your own uh, hopes and aspirations, uh, where, where would you like to go? What are your goals for yourself? I'm proud to be on your team, Controller. Um, I feel a great sense of purpose in being able to represent all of the different communities that I belong to, whether it's Tibetans, Himalayans, um, women, women of color, immigrants, Asians. Um, looking ahead, uh, I hope I continue to um, contribute to ensuring that our system um, works empathetically and effectively to address the needs of those most, most underserved. Um, and I hope I remain true to myself, which I'm sure you'll tell me if I don't. <laughs> well, <laughs> Pema, for sure you do remain true to yourself and you carry on a wonderful tradition of your family in terms of service and very proud representative of the Tibetan people. And we are just so grateful for your spending time with me and sharing your personal story. And I'm sure for our, our viewers really learning a lot, not only about you, but about the Tibetan community here in New York. So thank you very much, Pema. I wanted to especially thank you for uh, giving me this opportunity and for um, using your platform to bring visibility and uh, a greater understanding of the Tibetan story. My story in part or in full is the story of many other uh, Tibetan exiles you will meet um, in the diaspora. Um, and events like these are definitely uh, a move in the right direction towards representation and inclusivity. Um, and as I always say, uh, this, these types of recognition for me is really less about myself 
and more about community and representation. And thank you again. Beautifully said, very eloquent. Thank you, Pema, so much. And thanks to all of you for watching our discussion and uh, happy Asian Pacific American Heritage Month. We're very pleased to celebrate the AAPI community here in New York. Thanks so much for watching.